Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, tonight, if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 2 Samuel. And we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter number 5 tonight. Great story out of the Word of God. And uh, the title of today's message is Victory Every Day. What if I told you tonight that you could have victory every day? See, sometimes people take a look at that and they say, victory every day. Well, that's cool and, and that sounds nice. That's a nice idea and, and sort of a pie-in-the-sky philosophy there, Pastor Dan. But you know what? I, I just don't see that in my life working out. And yet tonight I submit to you that if you will listen to what the Word of God has to say and apply it to your life, and guess what? It is so simple. It is so easy. God is not making it hard on us. God's not laughing at us. God's not putting us through the ringer so that we can maybe hopefully get to a victory sometime in some way in our lives. No, God is telling us tonight, you can literally have victory every day. First of all, we know that our victory doesn't come from the place that we're in. It comes from the place that we're in in Christ Jesus. And he's already overcame, and now by faith we're walking in that victory. But did you know that the Lord has specific directions and a specific way for you to live your life so that while you're here on the earth, you don't have to live broke down, busted, and disgusted. You don't have to keep trudging through and wondering what God's doing and where's God at and all that kind of thing. No, you can know the will of the Lord. Now, let me preface everything I'm saying tonight because we're going to get into some things that I don't want you to get uh, an idea that I'm, I'm saying something that I'm not, okay? What, what I want to preface the Word of God with tonight is this, is that we have the will of God right here. That's why I asked you if you had your Bibles tonight. This is the will of God for our lives. You can literally find out what God's desire is for you, what God's plan is for you, what the purpose and destiny, the passion and the heartbeat of God is for your life. You can find that out from the Word of God. There are specific scriptures and passages that apply each and every day. Every day we're supposed to be thankful. Every day we're supposed to praise the Lord. Every day we're supposed to connect with God in prayer. Every day we're supposed to do those things, and we're supposed to do them just the same, okay? So, so before I get into anything that I'm going to say tonight, I needed to lay that foundation because if I didn't lay that foundation, you might get a little confused and say, well, is Pastor Dan saying that? No, no, no. So we'll get into that, and you'll understand why I had to say that uh, before we got into the word of the Lord. Let me set the stage for you, 2 Samuel chapter number 5. King David, right, has just been anointed king. He's been king over Judah, the southern tribes, but now all of a sudden here comes Israel and they finally recognize David as king over all of Israel. So the elders come together, they make a covenant together, and now David becomes king over the united kingdom. Now there is the northern tribes and the southern tribes of Judah, they're not split, they're not under their own reign, now they've all come under David's authority. And so because of this, the Philistines realize something's going on, that now there is a united kingdom and they are now under one man, whereas before it was Saul and Saul was kind of doing his own thing, he was going after David, then he was fighting battles and he was back and forth and he was weak, he didn't have the full support of Israel. Now David has the full support of the entire kingdom and the Philistines raise up their ugly head and they say, well, wait a second, if David has the entire kingdom and starts to consolidate his kingdom and bring them together in unity, this could be bad news for us. So let's pick up the story there in 2 Samuel chapter number 5. And I'm going to start in verse number 17. Look at what it says. It says, Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now don't you know just when things start going good in your life, the old enemies of the past are going to come up and raise their ugly head come against you. I want you to notice it says all the Philistines went up. See, this wasn't just a few. This just wasn't Goliath's family that was mad about what David did to Goliath when he was a youth. No, this is the entire nation now is coming against David. His old friend that he stayed with when he was acting crazy, running from Saul, has now become his foe once again. Maybe it was ringing in their ears that Saul had slain his thousands and David would slay his tens of thousands. And so they started shaking their boots and they said, we better go after him right now. They start searching for him. Verse number 18, the Philistines also went up and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, the valley of Rephaim, the Rephaim were giants, okay? You can find them in the book of Genesis. You can find them all throughout the Bible that these were giants. So here are the Philistines. Now, remember, Goliath was a big dude, right? About nine foot tall, maybe ten foot tall, something like that. He was a a giant of a man, And, and he had five ugly brothers, 
that came along with him that were all just as giant. And so here's the Philistines, a giant people, now coming against David, and they're in the valley of the giants. Can I say it to you like this? They were in their home turf. They had the home field advantage. Here's David down in the stronghold. Here they are in their home field, and now they're in battle array. Verse number 19, so David inquired of the Lord. Very important. I want you guys to note that, that David went and asked God a question. David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? Two questions. Shall I go up against them, and will you deliver them into my hands? See, be one thing to go up against them, another thing to have them delivered into his hands. And the Lord said to David, go up. For I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hands. In other words, you don't have to worry about that, David. I've got all of this under control. I'm going to take care of this. You go ahead and you go up. Do what's in your heart to do. Let's find out what happens. Verse 20, so David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perizim. Now that Perizim is Perez, it's that breakthrough. And David recognizes that this wasn't just his own power, this wasn't his strength, this wasn't his military might that took care of this. No, this was God who is the master or the Lord, the Baal, right? That means master, and he says Perizim of breakthroughs, like water breaking through a dam. Think about that for a second. What happens when water breaks through a dam? Usually it starts out as a little pinprick of water spouting out, right? And, and we all get the image of the little kid in the clogs with his finger in the hole in the dam, right? And holding together the levee. But what happens when he takes his finger out and that little water starts to trickle through, eventually it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until finally that whole thing just breaks wide open. And that's God. God brings us into ever-increasing victories in our life. As we grow in the things of God, we start to realize that, yes, I may have had little victories in the past, but it's not because of me. It's because of God, and God gives me greater and greater and greater and greater victories. Even though I may be going up against the giants, even though they may be in the home field advantage, God will break through my enemies. God will take them out before me. God will take care of my life. God will give me the victory, and we can say he is the master of all breakthroughs. Now, that's good enough to shout about right there, but take a look at what happens. It says, and they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. Now, the reason why they did this was because in the book of Deuteronomy, they were commanded that as they had victories, that they should carry away these images, not to worship them, but that they were to destroy them. Are you listening? So they literally plundered their enemies of their gods, and then they went, and if you read in the book of First Chronicles, you'll find out that they burned them with fire. Okay, these were images of wood, images of stone, images of, of different animals and different things that they worshipped. And so therefore, they took these images and they broke them to pieces. They burned them with fire completely and utterly destroyed them. I love how, uh, how in the Bible it gives you comparisons and con contrasting statements. See, the same Philistines who, when they had captured the Ark of Israel, were overtaken by the Ark. Now that they're overtaken by Israel, their gods didn't save them. And now their gods are overtaken by Israel when they're in their hands. And we all need to understand that it doesn't matter what the enemy has on their side, what they think that they know, what they raise up above us. They could say education, they could say science, they could say politics, they could say world systems, whatever they could say, philosophies and ideologies of men, they could say experience or numbers or power or strength. Whatever it is that they bring against you, it is still not enough to take you captive or to ruin you. No, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And you will not only overtake your enemy, but those things which they have raised up against you, you don't have to fear and you don't have to worry about it. Why? Because you will destroy those things and cast those things down that have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God. And your God of breakthrough will not only give you the breakthrough and the victory, but he will utterly destroy your enemies from before you. And wouldn't you know verse number 22 comes along. And this is just like our lives. Here we have a great victory. Here we, we've seen God break through. We've seen that, man, I used to be bound, used to be in drugs, used to be into the scene, used to be into the clubs and things like that. And, and I was bound. I kept going back to it like a dog returns to its vomit, kept going back down those roads. And yet finally I got breakthrough. God gave me victory in this area of my life. Bound by chain smoking. Couldn't get off cigarettes for the longest time and yet finally I had breakthrough and I was able to put it down and never pick it back up. 
Oh, I, I was bound to the bottle, and yet God delivered me. God gave me breakthrough. I was bound by, by sexual addiction. I was bound by pornography, and yet God finally gave me breakthrough, and now God has given me the victory and has destroyed those things from before me. And then in life, you know what happens? Verse 22 happens. Take a look at it with me. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, is there deja vu or something going on here? Because didn't we just read this verse? Didn't we just hear that the Philistines, the giants, assembled themselves on their home turf in the valley of Rephaim, the valley of the giants, right? So here's the Philistines. Here they've been broken through. Here they've had their gods destroyed, and yet they come again. And in our lives, the Bible says that each new day that there's battles that we have to face, things that we're going to have. There's trials that come against us. And sometimes we'll sit down and we ball and we squall and say, I don't know why the devil's picking on me. Can't he go pick on someone else? You know, I already defeated him. I already, I already beat this. Why is this coming up again? Anybody ever feel like that other than Pastor Dan? Any honest people in the place? Okay, cool. There's a bunch of you guys out there. Thank you. But for some reason, we'll, we'll either start to ball and squall and cry about it, and yet we know that the devil's defeated. We know that he's under our feet. So we say, well, maybe there's a problem with God. Maybe God's mad at me. Maybe God has a problem with me. Maybe there's something that I'm not doing right. Maybe, maybe it could be that I'm not holy enough, or I haven't prayed enough, or I haven't read enough, or I haven't done enough. And yet, David, when the battle comes against him again, he doesn't fret. Look at what he does. Verse Number 23, therefore, or because of what I just said about the Philistines coming to the valley of Rephim, the valley of the giants, therefore, David inquired of the Lord. Now, deja vu, right? Two days, two battles, same foe, same field, and yet David asked the question again. Look at what he does. David inquired of the Lord, and he, it says... Uh, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up. Circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. Verse 25, And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Now, we're going to bring out some truth throughout this story in a little bit. And to find out what it is that made David an overcomer. What made David the one who won the battle over two days. See, two days, two inquiries, two battles, two approaches, and two wins. What made David have victory every day? If we can get a hold of these truths in our lives, then we can have victory every day in our life. Oh, I should have had a bigger amen than that. There you go. See, because the Bible is contained for thousands of years, not for us just to have a history lesson of battles of Israel. That's interesting. That's great. But listen, if that's all it is, we might as well watch a movie, right? Why don't they just put the, the Bible to a movie and we can just watch the movie and then we know about it and then that's it? See, this is not just a history lesson. This is the word of God for you and for me. This is God's instructions for our life. This is contained, the Bible says, if you read in the New Testament, it says that all of the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament have been preserved and have been given to us as examples for how we ought to live our lives. All the stories about the children of Israel wandering in the desert, examples, don't provoke the Lord, don't tempt him, don't test him. Follow the Lord in obedience. All the examples of Jesus showing us what God is and what God looks like and his character, his nature, his attributes. And now King David shows us how we are to rule and to reign in life. Are you listening tonight? What made David victorious every day? Every day, a couple of things that we're gonna take a look at. A couple of things. Every day, what made David victorious? Every day, ask God what to do. Every day, you should be asking God. Every day you should be entering into the presence of God. See, if God is the master of breakthrough, then don't you think that God knows how your day is going to go? And if there's obstacles, if there's giants in the land, and if you're going to their home turf, you ever felt like you're going to the giant's home turf? moment you step on the job and everybody's at the water cooler laughing, they see you coming and they stop. They look at you. Home turf, Right? Every time you 
you dread it, but man, it's the holidays, and I guess we're going to have to go over to the in-law's house for supper, right? And so you show up, and you've got your casserole, and you get those disapproving looks as you're getting out of the car because you got that sticker from that crazy church on the back of it, home turf. Every time you go to the grocery store and you look at all the magazines on the side and the people in front of you are talking about craziness, the people behind you are talking about craziness, and you're wondering, is there any sane people on the planet? See, it's the home turf. And we walk through it all the time, and yet, if you will ask the Lord, God, what is it that you have for me today? God, what what is the the divine appointments that you set up for today? God, you are the master of breakthrough, and God, I feel like I'm hitting a wall, but God, I'm going to keep hitting. God, I'm going to keep going. God, I want to know what it is that you want me to do. Where do you want me to hit? How do you want me to hit? Why do you want me to hit, God? Show me what it is, Lord. Reveal it to me. God will give you the answers. See, David inquired of the Lord. Two times we see two different questions. God, shall I go up and will you deliver them into my hands? God says, go up, for I will most definitely give them into your hands. See, that's all David needed was a word from God that he could move on. And in our lives, we need to remember to ask. You know, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. It's a great verse, great verse to put to memory. And in our lives, we need to remember that this is not about us coming in our own wisdom, but about us going before God in his wisdom. Now, that same section of scripture in the message paraphrase, I love the way that, uh, that it's said in the message paraphrase. Let's put it up on the overheads. And it says this, trust God from the bottom of your heart. See, if you trust God as the master of breakthrough, then you're going to ask him, God, what do you think about this? God, when I get there, what do you want me to do? God, when I'm confronted with these people, what do you want me to say? God, when I'm confronted with this situation, this giant that I've been facing, God, how do you want me to approach it? Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. And I tell you, in my life, there have been things that I've tried to figure out. I've tried to go after. I've tried to do it in my own wisdom. I've tried to calculate it. I've tried to rationalize it. I've tried to talk my wife into it. I've tried to, you know, tell everybody else. I've tried to speak to myself. And yet, God is sitting there waiting, going, son, are you ever going to talk to me about this? Because I got the answer. You know, I think of Jesus in the parable of of the stewards, right, or the parable of the talents. They come, and, and, and there's the one guy that had five. He went out and traded and bought and sold and got five more. The other guy had two. He went out and tra- saw what the first guy did, right? And so he was wise enough to say, well, hey, he did that. I'm going to go do that too. He uh, bought and traded and, and made more, got brought two more, right? The one guy comes back and said, I buried it in the ground. And what does the master say to him? You wicked and lazy servant. And then do you know what the master does? So interesting to me. The master actually gives him the plan of how he could have at least made some interest. So he should have just deposited in the bank. Now, wait a second. That means that guy with one talent, all he had to do was say, Master, I'm not as smart as those guys. I'm not as cool as those guys. I, can't, I don't have the get up and go personality like the f- first guy with five. And, and I'm not as smart as the second guy with the two who can look and see and do. So what do you want me to do with this? Because I'm just not all that great. Well, at least you could put it in the bank. That way, when you give it back to me, you give it back to me with interest. Ah, now I've got instructions. Now I can go do it. Now when I return it to him with interest, at least he's happy because I followed directions. Wow. See, we need to trust God from the bottom of our heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Look at verse number six. Next verse says this. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. We need to be constantly having our ears open for what God is doing. Constantly listening for the sound. God, what what is it that you want me to do? God, what is your answer? Lord, what is it? Tell me, God, and search for the will of God in your life. Now, there are certain things that you can find in the word of God that you don't have to ask the question. We know it's the will of God for us to abstain from sexual immorality. Why? Because it's written in black and white right here on the pages of this Bible. We know that it's the will of God for us to be generous, right? Is that true? We know that it's the will of God for us to give thanks, right? So then we're not talking about those things. We're talking about, God, what is the approach? God, what's the battle plan? God, how do you want me to do this? Which brings us to the next thing. Every day, not only should we ask God what to do, but every day we should listen for the leading from above. Remember what God told David in the second battle? It's so 
captivating to my mind because I, I'm, I'm one of those people that picks out weird things, you know? There's, there's those little things in the Bible that God preserves for thousands of years that I wonder, why did God point out that in the Bible? You know, why was Deborah sitting under a palm tree? You know, she's one of the judges. Why was she, why did God have to point out she's sitting under a palm tree? Why not just a tree? You know, and I kind of think that way. I kind of look at those things. And so here we are, and I find that here's David, and God tells him the second day, don't just go up like you did yesterday. It's a new day. It's the same foe in the same field, and yet it's a new day. And God says, I don't want you to just go and do what you did yesterday. I've got a fresh word for you today. I've got fresh manna. There's a fresh revelation for you today. See, learn the lesson, church. The children of Israel could not take yesterday's manna and and store it up for the next day. Otherwise, it would have worms in it. They had to have a fresh manna. That manna was the bread from heaven, was the word of God. And every day, you need to be in the face of the Lord, listening for and, and, and getting ready for, God, I want to hear what your voice has to say to me. And so here David is, and David is so wise. He doesn't just presume, I'm just going to go up and win again. No, what happens? They've assembled again. These guys are crazy. Now, if it was me, I would have said, oh, look, they're back again. God gave them to me yesterday. He'll give them to me again today. And yet, I would have got whipped. Why? Because that wasn't the will of God in this instance. The will of God was, no, don't go up like you did last time. I want you to go around the back, and I want you to go by the mulberry trees. And I go, God, why did you keep these mulberry trees? Was, was that a special kind of tree? Did it have some sort of spiritual significance? Did it, you know, was there something about that tree? You know what God contained it? This is what God spoke to my heart about these trees, okay? You can take this or leave this. This is just what God spoke to me about this. You know why God said mulberry trees? Because it was specific. It was specific. It wasn't about the mulberry tree. It was just about the directions of the Lord. In other words, Here's the place that I want you to go, and I want you to wait there. Didn't matter that it was a mulberry tree. It mattered that it was a specific direction of God. Go about the back and wait at the mulberry trees. This is the place. This is the time. And I want you to wait there until you hear the sound above you of marching in the trees. Now, we can imagine that the army of God was above them, marching into battle before them, because he says, once you hear that sound, stir yourself up, get after it. Why? Because I'm going to go and strike the Philistines before you. And David drove them back at that moment. Right when he heard the sound, he was responsive. He went after it, and he drove them back. See, God will give you specific directions for your life. I had a friend who was uh, one of those super spiritual guys. You know what I'm talking about, super spiritual? That they just make you kind of crazy because you're like, dude, can we just come down out of the clouds for a minute and just hang out and like watch a show or, you know, talk about the weather or something like that. And, and he was a super spiritual guy. His name was Matt. Matt was, uh, was a neat guy and, and uh, he was a, a friend. Uh, I'm sorry. He was a cousin of a friend of mine. And so he was down in town for a while, and so we were hanging out, and a uh, good guy, and he was just on fire for the Lord. And I remember, uh, you know, I was, I was a young man, and I was on fire for the Lord too, but this guy was a whole nother level and, and was just, just kind of crazy and had gone on missions and prayed for the sick and seen miracles, signs, and wonders, and all that kind of stuff. And as we were talking, we were sharing experiences, and I'd done missions too, and so I was sharing some of the, the witnessing and the different things that I had done, and so he's sharing that. And then he tells me this crazy story that has just stuck with me throughout my lifetime. Matt was uh, in prayer. He was at, at his training school before he went off to missions. And he was in prayer and he was just seeking the Lord, pressing into God. And he was just asking God, God, I want to be used by you. God, I, I want you to do something amazing in my life. God, I want you to just use me for your glory. And so God told him, I want you to go down to the corner donut store and buy a bag of donuts. Now Matt said, at that moment I was kind of like, that was not God. That had to be my stomach because it was very early in the morning. And I love donuts and so you know that that couldn't be God so he ignored that leading and so he decided the next morning got up again and he's praying God use me God I want to be used by you God just just give me your wisdom give me your direction God I want you to do something miraculous in my life and so the Lord told him I want you to go down to the corner bakery store and buy a bag of donuts and so, no, that's, here we are again. I'm, I'm so sorry, Lord, please forgive me. Here I'm wanting to be used by you, and all I can think about is my stomach, God, forgive me. This happens five days in a row. On the fifth day, finally he says, that's it, I'm done, I'm not doing this anymore. So he gets up, he goes down to that corner store, and he buys a bag of donuts, and he's standing there, and he says, okay, God, what are we doing with the bag of donuts? And he gets nothing. So he's standing there, 
And he walks outside of the store, and as he's walking out, there's a woman walking in. And he looks at her, and he reaches into the bag of donuts, pulls out a maple bar, and he extends it out to her, and he says, Ma'am, I, I want to give you this donut and tell you that Jesus loves you. Couldn't think of anything else to do, right? So might as well do some donut witnessing, right? Donut evangelism. <laughs> the woman looks at him, and tears start to stream down her face. She starts weeping, and he's thinking, Oh, my God, what have I just done? And yet when she finally composes herself, she says, I'm so sorry. You don't know me, and I don't know you, and I don't know why God chose to use you in this way. But This is so embarrassing, but five days ago, my daughter and I were in prayer on the night, and my husband had left. And my daughter and I were praying that he would come back. And I told my daughter that God answers prayers. And so we were praying for my husband to come back to the house. And I said, if we believe and, and if we pray, then God will answer our prayers. So the next morning, I came down to the donut shop, and she wanted a maple bar, and there wasn't any there. So she said, Mommy, let's pray, and let's ask God for a maple bar, because if we believe, God answers prayers. So the next night, we prayed for Daddy to come home, and my daughter prayed for a maple bar the next morning. We came Tuesday, we came Wednesday, we came Thursday, and this morning, I got up, and I told God, God, I'm getting up early, and I'm going down to that donut store, and God, if there is not a maple bar there, God, I'm done with this. I'm done with this prayer thing, I'm done with you, I'm done with believing God, and I don't want you to break this little girl's heart, and then you walked up to me, extended a maple bar to me, and said, Jesus loves you. See, it's in the specific directions. God will speak to your life, unusual directions at times. I had another friend that was on the mission field, and uh, they, they were given directions, go buy a gallon of milk, and they were driving there saying, okay, God, what do we do with this? And God was giving them turn-by-turn -turn directions. Finally brought them to a house, and they went and knocked on the door of a house, and they said, we don't know why, but God wants us to bring this jug of milk to you. And they said, we just ran out, we have no money, and our children are hungry, and we have nothing, but you were God's provision for our life. See, there's story after story after story like this. And God wants to be involved in every area of your life. If you will listen for the specific leading of the Lord, God will bring you into crazy things. God will take you into an exciting adventure. Every day, you can have victory in your life as you follow the will and the way of the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Can you give God a praise for that? See, we don't need to box up God in yesterday. Just because God did it that way yesterday doesn't mean that that's the way he's going to do it today. Listen for God on the move. Look for where he's at and then go to where he is. He has a fresh word and plan for today. The plan for one battle may work that day, but tomorrow you need the now word. When you face tomorrow, you need a fresh revelation from God of what it is that he wants for your life. Even if it's the same foe in the same field, you're coming up against the same thing. Just say, God, I know I'm coming up against this again today, God. How do you want me to handle it? And God will give you the plan. I think of Jesus going about doing good and healing all. You know, Jesus, it's hard to find Jesus doing the same thing twice when it came to healing. Sometimes he'd just be sitting there teaching power to go out and heal people. Sometimes he would lay hands on them and, and heal them. Sometimes he would spit on the ground. <laughs> Right, and start rubbing together some mud, and then he'd wipe it on the eyes, and, and, and do you see anything? Sometimes he'd stick his fingers in their ears. I mean, Jesus did all sorts of crazy stuff. Rebuking spirits, and they'd come out, and people would be healed. Hard to find Jesus doing the same thing twice. You know, you can see the same thing when it comes to temptation. When Jesus encountered temptation, what did he do? He spoke the word. That's a good thing to do. But did you know that when P Peter was confronted with temptation, had, I want to buy the gift of God, right? Here comes Simeon talking to Peter, and I want to buy the gift of God. Here's a sorcerer, and he says, your money die with you, that you think that you could buy the gift of the Holy Ghost. What did he do? He just outright confronted it right then and there, called it out and, and dismissed it. And, and then what about Joseph? You know what happened to Joseph? Joseph just ran naked, right? He just ran out of place. The lady had his coat and took a hold of him and said, lie with me. What did he do? Right? And ran out. See, it's the same battle. It's all temptation, and yet you find three different approaches to it. See, in our lives, we need to recognize and realize that God has given us an arsenal. God has given us his word. God has given us his will. And God has given us his spirit to speak to our hearts and to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us in all of our ways. Amen? John chapter 16, verse 13 says this. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. 
For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will tell you things to come. Isn't that an amazing thought? The Holy Spirit will literally tell you things to come. You know what that means? He's going to show you a picture of what the future looks like. God already knows. God is the God who declares the end from the beginning. God is over time. God is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the first and the last. God already knows what's going to happen in our lives. It's no surprise to God. God has been the one that crafted and made the plan of the ages. Therefore, when you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can tell you, hey, you're going to meet a man in a blue coat. I want you to tell that man to meet you at the fax machine and tell him about Jesus on your lunch break. He can tell you that. Why? Because he knows that the man in the blue coat's coming to fix the fax machine. And on your lunch break, you can lead them to the Lord. God knows all that kind of stuff. God understands the times and the seasons that we're in. God will show you there's going to be a knock at the door or you're going to encounter a problem. You know, God will tell you, hey, get ready, you're going to go through a trial. God doesn't only just show us the good stuff and the miraculous. No, God can show us bad stuff too. You know why? Because that doesn't worry God. God's not afraid of a fight. Come on, somebody. God is not afraid of a battle. Philistines coming up two times. God's not sitting there knocking his boots. Oh, David, I had you one day, but I don't know what you're going to do this new day. No. God is saying, no, I've already got the plan. I've got the wisdom. Let me show you how you're going to win this battle in life. And God knows when you're going to encounter that same thing again, and he has the plan of God for you and for me. So what do we got to do? We got to ask God what to do every day. We got to listen for the leading from above every day. And finally, so simple, so easy, carry out God's plan. Just do what you heard. Do it the way that God told you to do it. Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. If God told you to give an amount, give that amount. If God told you to give it on that day, give it on that day. If God tells you how to do something, do it that way. Why? Because if David would have went up like he did the day before, he would have lost. But the fact that David took the specific instructions of God, waited until he heard the sound of the army marching above him in the trees, and then ran out, now David has two victories on two days. Same enemy on their home turf. 2 Samuel in chapter 5 and verse number 24 in the old King James Version says to not only move quickly but to stir yourself. See, we've got to stir ourselves up. Why? Because there's times, and I know I'm guilty of this, where we've heard the voice of the Lord, like, get up and pray, right? And what do we do? That couldn't be God. Okay, that's what I do sometimes. And yet if you have the specific direction from the Lord, stir yourself. Why? Because if you lose some sleep, God will make up for it. If you lose some money, God can provide for you. If you lose face with some people because they don't think that you're as cool anymore because now they know that you love Jesus, oh well, God will give you new friends. People who love Jesus, people who will encourage you in the faith. Listen, sometimes you don't just have to stir yourself, sometimes you have to slap yourself. Come on. You know I'm talking truth now. Because it's so easy to slump into lethargy and apathy. It's almost like we're in a food coma, right? Well, we've got the word of God and we're so full. And oh, I had such a spiritual experience. I'm on the mountain, right? And then we kind of fall asleep on the mountain. Like Peter, let's pitch three tents here and just hang out, Jesus. It's a good place. And Jesus says, no. We're not going to stay here. There's stuff to be done. We've got to go down to the valley. There is a rescue mission that God has ordained and outlined for us. There's a battle to fight and win. There's plans that God has for us. There is a valley to take an inland empire and a world that is waiting to hear about Jesus. So we need to carry out God's plans. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. The apostle Paul is writing and he says, To this end I also labor. Look at the word. Labor, it's work. Striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. See, David got up and he fought the battle because God had already struck the Philistines. But David came in and he gathered up the results. It's the same way in our lives. When you pray and when you get God's direction and God's approval on your life, you find out what the will of God is for you, you've already struck the winning blow. You can win in life every day. And then as you carry out the directions of God, all you're doing is gathering up the results. Just like King Jehoshaphat, what did he hear? Put the praisers out front, right? And, and, and go out and do this. What, what about the other kings? Dig trenches in the ground and then just fill them up with water. The water comes and fills it up and all of a sudden a great battle is won. 
See, there's all sorts of examples of this all throughout the Bible of people who asked, people who heard, and then people who did. And as they did, God brought the victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. He is the master of breakthrough. And therefore, all you got to do is walk in obedience to God's commandments for your life and gather up the results of your obedience. I want to close with a story that has impacted my life and encouraged me oftentimes. There's a couple of men that were traveling through an art museum. One of them was an international chess champion, and the other one uh, was an art lover. And so they're walking through this, this art gallery, and they're looking at different pieces, and they came to one that showed a chess game. Now, the international chess champion was intrigued, and he started to look over this chess game. And he, and he started to look at the quality of the painting, and he realized one of these guys looked like, uh, you know, a very royal, very regal type person. The other one looked very evil, very wicked. And the one that looked so wicked kind of looked like the devil, right? And, and he's looking at him, and, and, and as he's looking, he sees that this, this evil one seems to be winning the match. And, and he's intrigued. He's looking at it, and he, and, he, and he talks to his buddy that's there with him, this art lover, and, and he, says, he says, isn't this a great painting? He says, I'm intrigued by it. It's, it's beautiful, and yet I, I, I'm just fascinated by it because I'm an international chess champion. And, and so, therefore, you know, I'm looking at this, and, and it, just, it just captivates me. And so he says, you know what it's called? It's called Checkmate. And he says, wait, wait, wait. Checkmate. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I, I'm an international chess champion. And, and this, this painting it intrigues me. And yet it's called what? It's called Checkmate? Hold on. Hold on. Something's wrong. And he starts to create quite a stir. And so he's standing there and he's looking and he's calculating and he's making moves in his mind. And as he's looking over this painting, a crowd starts to gather. And he stops for a moment and he says, ah, I've got it. Where's the painter? Who painted this? And he says, why do you want to know who painted it? He says, because you need to call him here right here and right now. He said, call him here? What are you talking about? He says, because this, this painting is all wrong. Either he needs to change the painting or he needs to change the name. He says, what are you talking about? Change the painting or change the name. You're talking crazy stuff now. He says, no, I'm not crazy. I am an international chess champion. And therefore, when I look at this painting and when I see what's going on here, the, the painter has to do one of two things. He either has to change the painting or change the name because I know what I'm talking about. I am an international chess champion. And they Finally, the guy frustrated says, well, why? Why do you say that? What are you talking about? And he says, here's why. Because the king still has one more move. See, our God is the master of breakthroughs. And you may be in a situation where you feel like you're on the devil's home turf and there are giants facing you every morning when you get up. And it doesn't matter what the battle you face. It doesn't matter if the devil has slapped down his last final play and has said, checkmate, you might as well lay down and die because the king still has one more move in your life. God has a plan. God is the master of all breakthrough. And God will do what he said he would do in his word. He leads us in his triumph. He has made us more than conquerors. You are an overcomer. You are blessed of God. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are prosperous. You are successful. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. And God has made you to win in life. As you meditate on the word, as you ask God the questions and say, God, what is it that you have for me this day? God, what is the direction that you have for my life? And then listen for his voice. Listen for the sound of heaven above you. And then stir yourself up. When you hear that sound, when you know what it is that God has called you to do, go after it, church, and go gather up the results through faithful obedience to the word of God. Can we give God a praise tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. God. Hey, I want to thank you guys for staying put. I want to give you guys an opportunity in a couple of ways. To respond to the word of God. One thing to hear the word, another thing to respond. And tonight, I want to start with those of you who you haven't yet given God all of your heart. You haven't yet given God all of your life. And I want you to just take a moment and examine yourself. You know, the Bible says it's good for us to examine ourselves, test ourselves out, see whether or not we're in the faith. And so sometimes people will come and they'll, they'll wonder about, how do I get to heaven? How, what makes me a Christian? Am I a Christian? I get to go to heaven because I've been good? Because, you know, I've heard that God lets good people into heaven. But let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere, 
Does God say just be good enough and you get to heaven? You know why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And you're not going to make it just by being good or giving your money to charities, helping out or, uh, you know, being involved in social justice, that sort of a thing. Not going to get to heaven just because you've been good. No one in the Bible say just be good and you get to go to heaven. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. Isn't that count for something? You know, my parents told me you were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. You, you went to religious classes like Sunday school, maybe Sabbath school or catechism class. And, and you've always considered yourself to be a Christian. You're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere. Does it say you get to go to heaven because your parents raised you in church, tell you're a Christian? No, the Bible say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or attend, uh, you know, be born in America, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Come on, let's, let's talk tonight. Listen up, give me a couple more minutes of your attention. Because I want to talk about your eternal life, where you're at with God. Because if you're not right with God and you leave this place in that condition, you died, you go to hell and not go to heaven. Let's talk. Some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, you just got real serious. I don't believe in hell. Hell's, you know, a fairy tale that parents made up to scare their children into being good, isn't it? No. Do you know the Bible talks about hell, Old and New Testament? Jesus himself spoke of hell. It's a very real place. And you're not going to avoid it by just burying your head in the sand. It's not how this works. There's one way you're going to have to get to go to heaven. You might be thinking, but pastor, I heard that all roads lead to heaven, don't they? You just do whatever you want to do. I can do my thing. You do your thing. The churches out there and the religions, you know, they, they can do their thing. And they'll make it to whatever heaven they call it. You know, we'll all make it there somehow in some way. Just, just stay true to yourself. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible says stay true to yourself? Do whatever you want to do and you get to go to heaven. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, Carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. I think he'd go through all that and then say, yeah, whatever you want to do, just, just do, do your thing. Stay true to yourself, I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't do that at all. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What's that mean? That means it's God's heaven. Going to have to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, okay, I get all that. I understand all that. But here I am sitting in church right now, and I consider myself to be a Christian. It wasn't just a thing when I was a child. I, I'm in church right now. That's great. I'm glad you're here. But let me ask you a question. If I, if I decided I wanted to be a Dodger, I went down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, bought a Dodger uniform, put it on, went and sat in the Dodger dugout, brought my bat and my ball and called myself a Dodger, would, would I be able to expect to get to play in the game? No, you know what's going to happen. They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a member of the Dodgers organization. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I got involved in my last church, helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, and, and, and taught in the Bible class. I got a membership card to that church. I, I could show it to you. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible say your church involvement gets into heaven? God's not waiting at the gates of heaven, counting up the hours that you volunteered in church to see if you can make it. God's not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. You say, but pastor, hold on. You don't understand. I know God. I, I know about Jesus. Easter and the resurrection celebrated every year of my life. Sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor. Old and New Testament, doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? Well, if that's what that means, haven't you read your Bible? The devil knows who Jesus is, believes he's the son of God, can quote scriptures out of his mouth. He's not qualified for heaven. The demons know who Jesus is and believe that he's the son of God. Are they Christians headed for heaven? No. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. Not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus came and he said this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not. But this is not about what books, movies, Hollywood, television, and the internet say. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Remember, it's about the heart. God is asking for all of your heart. And he's asking for all of your life. Specific directions. You must be born again. 
It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again. And occasional ch church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And you might be saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be, but let's get over that tonight. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet insecurity is going to try and hold you back. Devil's going to try and talk you out of it right now and just tell you, oh, it's just emotions. You don't have to do it. You're fine. Just do it another way. No, listen, one way, specific directions. You must be born again, giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. Listen, be bold. There's no one judging you, criticizing you, or condemning you. This is a friendly, loving place. And we're excited for you. And listen, even if you're embarrassed, it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever. So tonight, come on, will you make that choice? Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life in this safe and friendly church service? You can do that in a moment. Who should raise their hand? That you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? Not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise their hand? Well, hey, you've never done this. Never said yes to Jesus. Come on, I'm talking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up all across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe. Come on. If you can hear the sound of my voice down the breezeways or in the foyer out there, come on, get ready to get your hand up and then come into the church service or tell an usher right afterwards. If you're online, wherever you're at, all across the world and across the nation, God sees and he's watching. You can raise your hand right there and God will recognize you from heaven as given them all of your heart and all of your life and guess what there's a button you can press that says respond to God or on our homepage rockchurch.com how to know God someone will lead you in a prayer I'm going to count to three pop my hands together this is your time this is your moment of salvation here we go all together on the count of three one two three let me see your hands just raise them up high for me right now thank you there's one God bless you who else tonight there's two there's three four five thank you six got you over there seven eight God bless you guys who else tonight saying I need to give God all my heart I need to give God all my life eight is their hand over here eight wise people got you guys nine and ten thank you eleven up there keep pointing over here just give me a little wave if you got your hand up right now all right I don't see any other hands over there about ten wise people ten or eleven somewhere Anybody else real quick? I want to just give you a moment. Check yourself out. Test yourself. Find out. Ask God. Remember, you ask God, God, am I, am I right? He'll whisper in your ears, get your hand up. You'll get that specific direction right now. If that's you, just ask that question to God. Do I need to do this? If you hear the word yes in your spirit, right here in your heart, you know God's speaking to you right now. Just pop it up. If that's you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for about 10 or 11 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Those of you that raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, it's not too late. There's a couple more of you guys. You need to do this, all right? It's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap and a shout. As we do that, once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend, once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies tonight. We can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on down. Come on down. There is like you. If that's you, just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Cause no one else can touch my heart like you do. For the family of your children, raise their hand. You can bring them. Come on now, remember this. And find there is none like you. 
Even if you didn't raise your hand, just make it way to the front right now. Come on down. And there is none like you. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. No one else can touch my heart like you do. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. And I can search for all eternity long. Anybody else? They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. Like you. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on. Anybody else? Just make it right to the front right now. Come on, nudge your neighbor. Say, friend, I'll go with you. Come on. Come on. There is They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. No one else can touch my heart like you. Hallelujah. If that's you, come on, we'll wait for you. Come on down. I can search for all They're still coming. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, if that's you, just make way to the front right now. This is your time. This is your moment. I just, I have the cheesiest smile on my face right now. I know it because I, I either don't know how to count or a lot more of you heard from God and responded to the specific direction to get out here. Yes. Woo. And you know why I have this smile on my face? is because I know what's about to happen. You're going to give God all of your heart. You're going to give God all of your life. And you're going to be changed from the inside out. It, it's never going to be the same. Can I tell you something? God's on your side. And you have the victory every day. Just ask God, listen for his voice, and follow his direction. So simple, so easy. When I introduce you guys to a friend of mine, look at they're still coming. Come on down. Come on down right now. God is so good. When I introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here on my right, your left, this is Dr. Becker. Dr. Becker's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. He's going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay, brand new on the inside. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that I'm a Christian, what do I do next, okay? It's easy reading. It's free, okay? He'll give that to you. And then he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym? Helps you get strong, right? Okay. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually, okay? Five weeks, he'll teach you five things out of the Bible, one a week. So simple, so easy. He'll tell you how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family that came with you, they'll wait for you, all right? So now listen, listen. Let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year of your life here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center, sitting consistently under the teaching. If you can make it to Sunday nights, come on to Sunday nights. Make it to Sunday and Sunday morning or Saturday morning, maybe Wednesday night or the young adult service or women's Bible study, something like that. We have 11 church services a week here, okay? Get into one or two, three, four, be radical, five, why not, right? Okay, as you do after that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. You'll be so blessed. You'll look around and say, my goodness, I did not know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right, take their word for it, okay? You guys will make a left turn. Follow Dr. Becker right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Woo! Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.